Um, got it. Hello, everybody. Um, today, we're going to talk about something that we very early uh, need to be awareness to a lot of women out there. You know, a lot of women, you know, it, it, I have seen in a lot of death penalty cases where a lot of women is the ones that mostly side that say they for the death penalty. And they do that before they realize what the death penalty is all about. Because if you ask that person, um, what is aggravators? What is mitigators? They can't even tell you. But therefore, the death penalty, you know, it's hard to be for something that you really don't know anything about. And today, you know, we're talking about a case that is in Texas, one of the a state that I stay the hell of out, out of. Uh, ever since uh, a couple of years back, we had Todd Willingham in Texas um, accused of burning up his kids in the house. And a lot of the uh, evidence uh, came out later to show that, you know, um, it was done by faulty wire, you know, after his conviction. And it was uh, people that was sworn in to duty to, to, to do the right thing, uh, to fight for justice, uh, to be a law, law abiding citizen. Those are the ones that spoke up, but they still couldn't save his life. You know, and that shows that the death penalty in Texas to me is something that the governor is just proud of having and feel like he has to uh, create a legend. But today we want to talk about a case in Texas of a Melissa Lucio. And today we got, uh, how you pronounce your name? <laughs> My first name's Adrian and the last name's Larimer. And what organization you're with? Can you tell everyone? Um, sure, so I am a clinical teaching fellow at Cornell Law School and I'm with um, the Cornell Center on the Death Penalty Worldwide. And you, you guys are presently working on uh, Melissa Case, uh, which is a case where she is accused of, of killing her daughter because her daughter uh, tra tragically uh, fell down some stairs. Uh, can you tell people a little bit about this case right now? Sure, sure, Herman. Um, so along with the Innocence Project and um, the Capitol Habeas Unit out of Austin, we're representing Melissa Lucio. She was convicted, um, like you said, of killing her daughter. Um, the police alleged and the prosecution pursued charges alleging that she um, inflicted the injuries on her two-year-old daughter by beating her. Um, and, you know, looking at it now, um, the evidence actually reflects that Mariah, the daughter, um, fell down a rather large outdoor flight of stairs, hit her head at the bottom. Um, some of her siblings witnessed the fall. Um, and she got up and didn't appear to be, um, you know, terribly injured and over the next two days started exhibiting some symptoms, some, you know, she was a little lethargic, she wasn't feeling well, she didn't want to eat, um, you know, she was sleeping a little bit more than usual. Uh, and then she went down for a nap and just didn't wake up. Um, the family reached out to the authorities, 911, to get help for her. And on arrival, the police zeroed in on Melissa, took her immediately down to the police station, proceeded to interrogate her for five hours um, immediately after the death of her daughter, um, and used manipulative tactics, um, tactics known to elicit false confessions, until she eventually said, you know, I don't know what you want me to say, I guess I did it. And um, the state, used that as a alleged confession, pursued that at trial. And despite the fact that there was zero witnesses um, 
who can ever say that they saw Melissa hit any of her 12 children, um, who ever saw her be physically violent with anyone, um, convicted her in the beating death of her child. And so she's been on death row ever since. Now, I was reading something earlier about, about how cases like this uh, involve involving with children's, elderly, uh, hold on, I'm looking for it right now, it's in the, in the facts. Uh, but it says 70% of these cases are actually um, end up with, uh, okay, here it is. Nearly one in three exonerated women were wrongly convicted of harming children or other loved ones in the care, or nearly 70% were wrongly convicted of crimes that, that never took place at all, events that were accidents, death by suicide, fabricated according to the data from the National Registry of Exonerations. Now, with that being said, we're talking about a high number in cases with women involving children, uh, where the police, as in her case, uh, Melissa case, took her down now five hours, I mean, exhausted five hours and beating and badgering her to make her feel like she's the bad person because she's lost her child. Now in her state of mind, as we was talking about before, when you take in a child from a woman, and that's most likely what they did, threaten her to take her children. And then on top of that, she's, kept, she's not in the right mind because she just lost her child. I mean, five hours ago, her child just passed away and she's in this room five hours just being badgered, badgered like she's the bad person. And it shows that 70% of those cases that dealt with like that, women end up with wrongful convictions. So my question to you, um, with, with, with Melissa, well, have you ever been able to speak with her? Yes. I've spoken with Melissa. Mm -hmm. And how, how is her state of mind? I mean, what is she thinking like this? I mean, if she has to be really going through this. You know, currently she's doing as well as you can, you know, expect under the circumstances. Um, she is communicating with her lawyers uh, multiple times a week. She does get visits and support from her family. She's very religious, um, so she gets a lot of support from um, the Catholic faith, from her church and her community in the church. Um, you know, of course, Melissa is very remorseful that she didn't seek medical attention for Mariah sooner um, after she fell down the stairs and Mariah was showing some symptoms of, you know, not, not feeling quite right or just something was going on with her, but they were in the middle of a move to a new apartment. Um, you know, she didn't get all the information from the other children, you know, she just wasn't really feeling well, but she wasn't exhibiting extremely alarming symptoms. But of course, looking back, Melissa regrets not going and getting her medical attention. And certainly, you know, having to live with that is, is torturous for her. But, you know, maybe making some bad choices as a parent or not being, um, as present as she maybe should have been in terms of looking after her kids doesn't make her a murderer and doesn't make her responsible for the death of Mariah. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the statistics that you were talking about are staggering. And, you know, of the 67 women who are on the National Registry of Exonerees who have been exonerated after a murder conviction, 17 of those, um, there were false confessions and 20 of those involved child victims. So, you know, these are techniques that are known by experts to elicit false statements, false confessions, for women to take responsibility for things that they're not responsible for. 
Um, during the course of that interrogation, Melissa asserted her innocence 121 times. Um, she denied abuse 21 times. She denied hitting anybody or hurting any of her children over 20 times. She told the police she didn't know what happened or that it wasn't her 63 times. And the state from all of that focused on her exasperated statement of, you know, I, I, okay, I don't know what you want me to say. I guess I did it. And they're calling that a confession. And that statement is the majority of the evidence used against her at trial. There's no, there's no witness testimony that ever saw her um, harm anyone. And so it's particularly alarming how little evidence there is in this case and just how far you know, the state went in, in pushing um, this conviction and this circumstance, this tragedy. And the thing about it is that as you talk about the evidence, two things was used against her uh, in the evidence that uh, led to her confession was the officer testimony and it was based on the simple statement, I guess I did it. Now, here it is, it has some evidence that I feel that the jury should, should have seen um, is here. The fact that here she has been had reportedly, uh, repeatedly sexual assaulted, domestic violence, a long life of trauma, a long life of trauma. But yet, even though she's had that trauma, there has been thousands of pages of child protective service records that show that she never brought violence towards her kids. And I think that is something that should have been used in court because it is a woman that has been tortured repeatedly. I mean, she got out of one relationship and ended up in another marriage, but she had nine other kids and felt like he was going to kill her, you know, he beat her or he raped her. But yet, what was her strength? She clenched to her kids to show them love. She showed them no type of violence. She no, showed them no type of way of being harmed. And I think that, you know, this women out there need to pay attention to cases like this because. You never know it may happen to you here. When you're moving, you're moving and you got all these kids, you're trying to, you're trying to maintain these kids, you're moving. You can't watch every single one because you're constantly told boxes and stuff like that. So women, you got to keep in mind that if you sitting here and you know you're cleaning your house and the child slip and fall on your 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 floor and get a head injury and end up. Uh, passing away, you could be charged with murder and sentenced to death for the same thing. And this is type of stuff that needs to stop. And this is why we do these shows so that people can get involved like this. Don't let it wait until it's been affected by you and then you reach out and say, hey, hey, can you help me? Because it's not help when you're, you're, you're facing it. Is help maybe after in the process, but you've been served so many years. But if you can sign on to and give the support that's needed, contact the, um, the governor in Texas, the VA, you know, uh, your legislators, or whoever, tweet about this case, talk about this case, bring a women, it's like women awareness. You know, it's, it's not, you know, like, Everybody's trying to turn their backs to women being battered and traumatized. There's many networks coming up that about traumatizing, but everything's been mostly focused on men. What men is doing incarcerated, what men are facing, but the ones dealing with the women are actually kept on a low key and they're treated much harsh. They're treated Absolutely. much different. Absolutely. The gender bias in this case and across the board in these circumstances, especially when women are mothers, um, you know, is is alarming, um, especially here. Um, you know, the police put pressure on Melissa because she was a mother and, you know, threatened her with her status as a mother. 
there was another parent in the home when all of this was going on and her partner um, had a history of assaultive behavior. He wasn't treated like she was when he was questioned. He wasn't um, subjected to the type of coercive and abusive physical, um, you know, looming over her physically. The men who interrogated her had weapons. When she didn't give them the answers that they wanted, they would get closer to her physically. If she agreed to, you know, something they wanted her to say, then they would back up from her. And multiple men were coming and going from the room interrogating her. And for somebody who's a trauma survivor, this is an extremely um, hostile environment. And she, you know, did what she had to do to get out of that environment. Um, the other thing, you know, as we're talking about that is the disparity in the sentence here. Her partner, Robert, only got a four year sentence for allowing endangerment to children, despite the fact that the children's services record did reflect a history of violence with him and a history of violence that involved Mariah uh, pulling her arm or, you know, some of the younger children were afraid of Robert. So, you know, in this whole thousands of pages of CPS records that Melissa's defense attorney had, there are so many instances where the children are wanting to go back home with mom, where Melissa's having positive interactions with the children. There's no allegations of abuse of Melissa striking the children or harming them. And all of that is just overlooked and not brought out during her trial. And this is just a really tragic circumstance where she didn't have um, competent counsel representing her interests. None of the children were called at trial to testify on her behalf. These records weren't properly gone through and the information wasn't brought to the attention of the jurors. And we've talked to the jurors um, in this case and that mattered to them. They wanted that information. So, you know, this is, this case is truly tragic and a situation where, you know, she has not received um, a fair trial. She has not received fair treatment in the hands of the state. And, you know, uh, something else that's, that's very suspicious about this case, um, her attorney immediately after the end of this trial went over and worked at the district attorney's office. The same district attorney who later was investigated for corruption and fraud during this very time her trial was going on and ended up in prison himself. And so there's just a lot going on in this case that's suspicious, that's not fair, that shows that, you know, something more was going on here and that justice has not been served. You know what is suspicious? The death penalty is supposed to be for the worst of the worst. And here it is, you have a lady that never committed a crime in her life on death row because of an accident. Right. Not only did, did she become on death row, but all her kids were split up. So that family love that she was teaching them and embracing them with was destroyed. By who? Right. The state. And immediately after they had already lost a sibling, and now the state wants to take away that wants to take her away from them permanently. So to cause this family to have yet another loss on top of everything they've lost already. I, I really, you know, these are the type of cases that put me in my feelings. You know, you know and it's, it's, it's so hard because it's like, you, you see all the signs that this is wrong. And the people that has the power to correct it using procedures and policies to avoid from making the proper corrections, you know, and it's, 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 it makes me feel like, you know, here it is, we have a justice system, but the justice system only works for those that is in partnership with the justice system. In other words, uh, if my dad was a senator, trust me, I would have been, been convicted of that, or my dad was a, a big company or donated to elected officials, you know, I wouldn't be in the situation I am. And it's so devastating because now they're actually being so difficult and trying to be tough on the police officers and everything. But yet, there's nothing that 
been in, uh, implemented to be um, uh, a guidance over the state DAs. They can still do what they want to do, prosecute cases in the county they want to, and stick by it. Most DAs can know they got it wrong, and they still refuse to to uh, bring it to the right stage because they feel uh, it might affect their reputation because they plan on running for another office. So now, what is our justice system doing? Is we are getting justice or are we just enjoy creating victims at the hands of our personal gain? You know? and it's, it's truly you know, upsetting because the prosecutor's creed is to seek justice. It's not to secure convictions. It's not to ensure that the convictions that they get continue to stand when there's evidence to the contrary. And, you know, this, they, this um, you know, where they're charged with pursuing justice and they don't do that, that's even more alarming because they're the ones with the power to do so. And, you know, there's still time for the people who are in power to act um, and to stop this from happening. Um, and we're asking people to, you know, sign the petition, to call the district attorney's office if they're Texas um, residents and ask them to withdraw the execution date um, so that a real investigation can take place and Melissa can have an opportunity at a fair trial. You know, nobody's asking that Melissa be released immediately and with, you know, that there not be um, some looking into the case, but we're asking that at least she be given a fair trial, a fair shot to present the evidence that stands against her. And in fact, you know, you were talking about this a little bit, but in this case, um, a court has overturned her conviction for that very reason. The Fifth Circuit said that she didn't get an opportunity to present a defense. She wasn't allowed to present a full and complete defense as she should have. And that three judge panel overturned that conviction, but because um, the DA appealed when she, when she won, um, they had a, the full panel of judges, which is 17 judges, listen to the evidence and they um, reinstated her conviction, not because of the evidence and not because of what actually she was able to show, but because of the federal law, it's called EDPA, I'm sure you're familiar with it which is um, you know, widely criticized for stopping judicial review process, but on a procedural ground. So just you know, the procedure doesn't allow us to review the case for the reasons that you were granted relief. So there's no looking at the actual facts here. There's no real seeking out justice for Melissa. This is just you know, her, her conviction was reinstated, not because the evidence she presented wasn't compelling, but on a procedural basis only. And that's, you know, part of that problem with, um, you know, our DAs and the courts and the criminal justice system not really seeking justice, just doing things for procedural purposes and not actually looking at what's going on within the system. And it's the people without the resources that get the harshest sentences. And, you know, we've seen that time after time and something needs to be done about that. Now, they have sought an execution date for uh, April 27th. Uh, and the attorney uh, filed a motion to withdraw or modify her looming execution date. What, what is going on with that? What is the... Nobody's responded. Um, the DA hasn't responded to that request um, for the motion to, or for him to withdraw the execution date. Um, and so, you know, nothing. They have not responded at all to that motion. Now, this state attorney that uh, served 13 years now for extortion and um, bribery, you know, that shows that he's will try to win a case or win an election by any and all means. And here it is, you know, you see all of these problems in this case, and this case definitely is not right. What did they even apply anything like that towards take a look at that factor towards uh, her case? No, um, you know, the court really hasn't um, found grounds to give relief um, 
on, on those facts. Um, you know, despite the fact that all of that occurred during the time that Melissa was being prosecuted, and one of the cases that they looked at um, for corruption was actually a case where um, the district attorney at the time, Villalobos, was um, accepting um, some bribes to um, allow somebody, a, a, a man who had been abusive to his partner, um, to allow him to stay free, and yet pursuing the death penalty against this abused woman with this very questionable case where, you know, no crime has actually occurred at all. And the fact that, you know, this corruption and the fact that even her attorney immediately after went and worked for that same DA after this trial is just, it, it, it is beyond reason that these aren't reasons to take another look at this case and it doesn't cause you know, people to question the integrity of this conviction and that people want to proceed with an execution when, you know, the appearance of impropriety in this case is staggering. So what, I mean, what can, I, I know Texas is a very, very, very difficult state to reach to try because we found the Rodney Reed case down there. And, you know, uh, again, I would never forget Todd Willingham case. Um, and what can the people do to to actually help out with this? Do you have links? Um, they can go sign petitions. Absolutely. Um, what advice would you give them to? So, um, you know, the number one ways that people can get involved and help is. Um, the Innocence Project on their website has a petition um, to stop this execution. They can sign that petition. They can call the district attorney's office, ask him to withdraw the execution date. Um, they can share facts about this case on any social media platform they're using. The hashtag Save Melissa Lucio um, is what we're asking people to tag. Um, they can go on to, like I said, the Innocence Project's website or the Cornell Center on the Death Penalty's website for links to graphics and social media posts that they can share. Um, you know, our goal is to just get as many people informed on Melissa's case as we can and show support for her, show that, you know, the public doesn't support proceeding on an execution in a case like this where, you know, her innocence is very much, you know, supported by the evidence um, and that her conviction is not based on reason science, is not based on an actual confession. You know, the evidence here is so flimsy, it's practically non-existent. And the people can show support by getting involved in those ways um, and really just spreading the word about this and contacting, you know, the Texas government and saying, listen, we don't support this. This is not fair. This is not right. We don't want the state to proceed with this execution. And if you look in our comments uh, box up under this, you will see that uh, our staff have put some links inside, you know, urge the DA, um, freemelissalucid.org, free Melissa. So, you know, um, I want people to actually click on this, you know, share this video. We have to bring it aware because this is not only about Melissa. It's not only about Melissa. It's about future women getting charged with murder for their child when they really shouldn't be responsible for the, uh, the murder. And to receive death is, is a very tragical thing to happen because a child had an accident that slipped, you know, and in the records, it shows that the child actually has some type of, um, um, what would you call it, uh, the disability? Yeah, the records show that Mariah, um, especially for a two-year-old child, had a very extensive medical history. She had um, a problem with one of her legs. 
She had trouble walking. While she was in foster care, she fell and actually knocked herself unconscious, hitting her head on the floor. I mean, you know, Mariah falling and having trouble walking um, was not something that just occurred on this one occasion. This is something that was known um, by children's services. This is something that her foster parents were aware of while she was placed outside of her home. I mean, Mariah had a documented uh, problem uh, with maintaining balance and walking. And certainly her falling down the stairs is not something, you know, that, that is outrageous. Okay, so um, I didn't use up all that time. So, <laughs> you know, it is, I, I like this. We got a, a lot out, but I just still don't feel uh, so great about the fact that, you know, women facing criminal charges, you know, um, is a totally different than a man facing criminal charges. And to switch it to someone, you know, to, to, to create a victim and take them through so much trauma at the time that they're grieving them, they're lost is not justice, you know, it's, it's just not justice. And we got a long ways to, to, to actually get justice on track. But what people have to understand, you know, I look at, I go speaking and I speak internationally. And when I go speaking, it's like, they treat me like I'm got, uh, like a star. But what people don't understand is that, you know, this movement isn't about the person picture on the screen. It's about everybody coming together, signing the petition, standing up. You know, it, it, we're just sort of like the organizers of the situation to, to speak out about the situation because I experienced with it. But those that stand behind me or beside me, you know, those are very important people. And people that's like of yourself is a very important people. You have legal teams that, that's working on it, uh, on these cases. You got people put, signing petitions. You got people uh, creating awareness of, of the situation. It's a whole big universal ball game that makes this happen. And the more people that we have join us, the, the better it is. I mean, when we was dealing with Julius Jones' case, at the beginning, it was 6,000, maybe 6,000 um, signatures. Next thing you know, it went to a million. Next thing you know, it went to six million on a petition. It started grabbing uh, national attention. And the governor waited to the last minute to make a decision, but that governor knew he would never win another office if he didn't do the right thing. He knew with all these people, he can't go nowhere and get nobody vote because nobody ain't gonna vote for nobody that ain't gonna do right. And that isn't willing to listen. Absolutely. It's, so to the people. So people well, and have, I wanna I wanna soothe your soul a little bit too, Herman, by telling you that. Um, part of our project and part of what we work on at the Cornell Center on the Death Penalty Worldwide, we have a program called the Alice Project, and it's the first global focus on women facing capital punishment. So we're examining the role that gender plays in death penalty cases. We're looking at transcripts to see how women have been gendered um, and how gendered violence affects their cases. And so, you know, we're seeing too often women being prosecuted based on them being bad women or bad mothers, not because of the actual crimes committed and that's being used against them. So I, I wanna reassure you that I promise we're, we're looking into this for women, we're advocating for them and we're gonna to continue to do that. You know, that's what actually sparked me into this um, campaign that I've been doing lately on Cruel Justice about women we had, um, I forgot her name from Cornell on, on the show, and we was talking about how 
women are being discriminated. And you know, it blew my mind when they, in one case, the prosecutor walk around with her underwear because it was thongs. It tells yep. uh, like a woman is like a jazzy bell. You know, right. you, she it, can't be it, grieving it, and wearing a thong at the same time. Yeah, right. that was Natalie Greenfield from our office that you talked to, and that was the case of Brenda. Yeah, Andrews. Natalie Greenfield. Yeah, so yep. and, and Sandra uh, Babbar. So mm -hmm. you know it, that was that right there blew my mind, and it say. You know, me and the team at Witness the Innocent, Allison, Jenny, uh, Moraine, and all us, we sat down and you know what? We said we need to start writing something about the women. So that's why we're focused now on women cases. You know, we had Sabrina was on there and Sabrina talked about how she was mistreated and how guards used to try her and things like that. You know, what they think about women when they get arrested. I mean, this is ridiculous in that. And the bad thing about it is society actually judge women like that. So where do you get a fair child in front of your own peers when society think of, of, of it because of the underwear you wear, it, you know, you, you can't be a law abiding citizen, you know, right. it's crazy. But um, that what sparked it off with uh, me in this women thing. I'm, I'm about this women thing. And I feel like we really need to educate people. Well, thank you. We are so glad to have you as an advocate. And we promise to keep working. And we'd love to continue working with you to, you know, get to the root of these things and do something to change it. As long as we get that education out there, that's what's up. That's my goal in life. You know, I can't change things. But I've always told if one person can listen one person can try to add, make a difference. And that's our goal that we just innocent. But um, I want to thank everybody for joining. And I want to thank um, our executive director, Kirk Bloodworth, for um, allowing us to have this show. I want the board of directors um, and all the supporters. I especially want to thank my staff. I got the most amazing staff. Yeah, with this, I, I mean, my staff makes me so comfortable, and um, it's like it's like it's like you know, you got this comedian and he's going around and he has a staff with him, and everybody tell him you know this and that. So you know, it's like I got that staff, I got that staff, and I, I'm very thankful for them. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I want to thank you for uh, you and also your fellow colleagues at Cornell for joining us today and helping us bring this awareness out, the real life cases of these situations instead of me just talking about it. And um, I encourage people to go to their website, check out some of the information. You women, you, you, you know, you, you, you got to pay attention. You, you know, when I was younger, my, my mom used to tell me, my mom said, if, okay, if you don't want to listen to me, they got somebody out there going to make you listen. So let, let's not make them make you listen. Why don't you just go ahead and listen to me? And you go here yeah, and you read about Absolutely. this and learn about this. And then when if situation happens around you, you already know what you have to do. And you can advocate from the beginning of the when the person first get arrested all the way to the end. You know, and that makes a big difference if you can advocate when the person got arrested. And the only way you can do that is if you understand that how this justice system is working and the facts of the case. So I want to thank everybody again. And um, thank you for joining us at Cruel Justice. I'll see you next third week of next month and say so long. Thanks so much, everyone.